Okay, I think we're just about to start now. So thank you everyone for coming out here today and supporting New Voices and for coming to hear us speak about feminism in China. So New Voices began in Beijing with basically a group of journalists and creators who wanted to create a platform for um, women's voices and also create transnational solidarity um, and support for women working on China's subjects. So we have a few projects, um, including a literary anthology. We have a podcast talking about gender issues. And we also have a directory um, of female, speak, uh, female experts speaking about China. So um, a lot of our members in Beijing kind of went overseas and started local chapters, which is where we have New Voices London here with me and Li Jia. Um, and so, yeah, we're really happy that you guys can come out here today. Before we begin, I want to say thank you to Aki for helping us secure this venue at SOAS, um, and he was instrumental in helping out with this event. Also, our volunteers, James, Antonio, and also Alyssa. Um, and without further ado, I'll introduce our moderator, Mary. She is um, a lifelong feminist, and she was a Beijing correspondent for Newsweek. She also wrote for the BBC and The Guardian, and she was a campaign for reproductive rights in the 80s as well. So I'll hand it over to you, Mary. Thank you. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody very warmly to this first London meeting of New Voices. Uh, before I introduce the speakers, I'm just going to say a few words about how the evening will run. So uh, each speaker will talk for six or seven minutes, and then we will have a discussion. I have a few questions for them. And then it's going to be over to you. We'll have uh, questions from the audience, so please think about what you would like to ask them while they're talking. Thank you very much. So uh, we have quite a lot of information about our speakers up here. Um, Li Jia, Zhang Li Jia, is a writer who spans non-fiction and fiction. Uh, she's a social commentator and a journalist and a very frequent contributor to the BBC and to CNN and NPR. She has written um, an astonishing memoir about how she was consigned to work in a military rocket factory at the age of 16 and fought to continue her education and to learn English. And her latest book is a novel called Lotus about a prostitute. And I think if there's one real hallmark of Lee Jia's work and her writing, it's that she always looks for stories about people who are disregarded, and particularly women. Um, uh, Zhang Lei Lei is our second speaker, and we are incredibly lucky, actually, and privileged to have Lei Lei here, uh, because she is one of the foremost uh, voices in the Me Too movement as someone who has is very uh, prominent in the current um, efforts to ensure that women's issues are raised in China, even in quite difficult circumstances. And um, uh, I would like also um, to just introduce Xiao Mei Li, if you could uh, stand up and show us who you are. Uh, Shamali was has uh, was involved in the modern women's movement from 2010 2011 was involved in the bloody brides protest uh, which you know has had real consequences in changing um, well we can discuss how far it has changed the law but has certainly contributed to putting some pressure for the 2016 law on domestic violence and so between them they represent an incredible upsurge in extremely innovative campaigning. And uh, our final speaker is Jessie, Jessie Lau, who is a journalist from uh, Hong Kong and who has written for the South China Morning Post and uh, The Economist and Quartz and other publications. And she's going to be talking about so-called post-feminist Hong Kong and how some of these issues play out there. I think it's very important as well that we don't overlook Hong Kong um, at the present time because it's, it's uh, quite a litmus test for um, some ways in which the Chinese government is moving. Okay, thank you very much. Right. 
Right, okay. Hello, good evening. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, tonight, I'm going to share you the stories of uh, women from my family, my grandmother, who was a prostitute and a concubine, and my mother, a frustrated factory worker, and myself, a factory worker turned writer. And I hope their story, in some ways, illustrate the changing role uh, of women in China, and also I would like to discuss some issues facing uh, women in today, uh, in contemporary China. Um, my grandmother, in 20 years ago, writing in front of her deathbed, I discovered a long-kept family secret that my grandmother was a uh, courtesan uh, in her youth. I was, of course, shocked and I guess you don't associate your grandmother with uh, a sex worker, and particularly my grandmother who brought us up. Then my mother explained her story. My grandmother, Yang Huizhen, was born in 1914 in a small town just outside Nanjing called Zhenjiang. And she became an orphan at a young age of six. And then she was adopted by her aunt's family, who treated her like a slave. When she blossomed into a beautiful young woman at the age of 14, she was sold into a brothel. Um, it was a middle class establishment called Trinxianglo, spring of uh, Trinxianglo. <laughs> pavilion of spring, spring fragrance. It's the front always lit up by lanterns. She worked there for 10 years and it was on the, she met my grandfather on the job. Um, my grandpa was a small time grain dinner, grain dealing with grain and salt uh, in Zhenjiang and uh, she was very smitten with my grandmother and, um, and, and brought her out, installed her as a concubine. Has anybody seen the film Raise the Red Lantern? Oh, great, I'm sure. And if those who haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. It's a story set by China, uh, about a rich merchant got a few wives, and um, one wife and quite several concubines. The like, whichever, on a particular night, he, night he chose a lady that uh, her house will be lit up. Anyway, the concubine, my grandmother's position was certainly better than being a concubine. But uh, a concubine's position was not equal as a wife, and she, I think she suffered quite a lot. Only after they had children, and then moved to Nanjing, her situation improved. In 1949, um, when the Chinese Communist Party took over, men were ordered to have one wife. My grandpa decided to stay with his concubine instead of his wife. And perhaps for this reason, my grandmother was always grateful to the Chinese Communist uh, it was also, um, she, my grandmother was, had bounded feet and she was illiterate. She, in, after, in around the 1950s, in China started to set up this anti-illiteracy campaign and uh, classes. And my grandma learned to write her names in her, this kind of classes. Probably in some ways you could understand why she was grateful to the uh, communists and she loved Chairman Mao. Um, my grandmother, had such a, a tough life, but I think she belonged to the older generation of Chinese women who had this extraordinary ability to take suffering without bitterness. My mother was born in 1937, and she was 12 years old when the Chinese Communist Party took over power. And like, like many progressive young people, she, she welcomed this dramatic social transformation because the Chinese, the communists, brought such hope to this new nation. And then she was assigned to a job uh, to work at a, a factory. It was a state-owned military factory. Um, at back then, urban people, young people, were assigned jobs because the the government believed in the Marxist theory that only through um, in participating labor could women achieve emancipation to be liberated. Uh, my, grand my mother always thought she was she was very she considered herself very lucky because the factory the job she was assigned to was a state owned, which meant uh, cradle to gra uh, to grave social welfare. 
um, in reality, her life was quite tough, and she, um, throughout her life, working life, she did one type of job, was, which was ethic pickling, which involved lifting large parts of a machinery and putting it sunk in this chemical um, um, pool, which to be ethic treat, treated. It was very much a man's job, but the Chairman Mao's idea of uh, equality was to deny the physical difference. You know, equality was means the same thing. It was uh, um, man woman often was uh, to do, were assigned the same kind of a job. Um, those of you who are probably familiar with China, you've probably seen those uh, revolutionary posters. You know, at that time, the model women or the eye maidens from Da Zhai, Da Zhai the Tie Gong Niang. Da Zhai was an agricultural model in China. Women of the eye maiden from Da Zhai, they were tough as iron. They were, they were, they dressed like men. They looked like men. They could carry as much as night soil um, as as men. Um, you know, of course, Chairman Mao famously said that uh, women could hold up half the sky, but in reality, you know, the statement probably is as elusive as sky itself. You know, take my mother as example. You know, my mother had full-time job, and uh, she had to do all the housework. Um, and just quickly move on to myself. I was the number two child of a uh, working-class family. I was being number two child, I never had too much attention, so it could tell how much I relish this chance to, <laughs> to sit in front of you today. I grew, up in a, I grew up in a residential compound which belonged to the factory my mother worked for all her life. Um, I dreamed to become, I did well at school and I dreamed to become a writer and journalist. But when I was 16, I was just taken out of school. Um, to take over my mother's job. It was I was 16, that was 1980, so you clever people can quickly work out how old I am precisely. Um, so uh, probably a tiny bit of a history lesson. Um, Cultural Revolution ended in 1976 after death, shortly after death of Chairman Mao. And then Deng Xiaoping reform, introduced reform uh, opening up, which transformed China. That uh, in, 19, in the end of 1978, but that took some opening up reform, opening up policy took some time to take effect. By 1980, the economy was far from being vibrant, so there was a high unemployment. To solve the problem, um, there was a temporary policy which allowed children to take over their parents' job if the parents retire early. So my mother, being educated, I don't think she ever saw the value of education, so she retired early for me to take over her job um, and as a favor to me and because she believed the most important thing was to secure a job for her children. And I hated my life at the factory. I worked there for 10 years. I certainly wouldn't describe as that as the most fragrant part of my life. Um, so as an escape route, I decided to teach myself English. Um, with the hope of getting a job, get out of the factory, getting a job as an interpreter. Um, of course, now looking back, I mean, learning English effectively changed my life. What I learned was not just, not just the ABCs, but the whole cultural package. After I, after I improved my English, um, I began to listen to the BBC and VOA, which in a kind of you know, broadcast some real news instead of just propaganda. I become very political. Um, I had a writer's group. We always debated about political change, or the democracy, the answer to China. Um, so anyway, so I, when I finally left China in 1990, I come to England. And I, I signed up to uh, teach yourself. Um, I signed up to um, a journal, um, it's open university to study journalism. I, you know, the childhood dream stirred. I want to become a journalist. When I returned to Beijing, I returned to China three years later. I started my career as a fixer, helping foreign journalists. All oh, right. Okay. Sorry. Um, so anyway, so now I'm, um, I'm divide my time between Beijing and uh, London. 
Um, I'm grateful that uh, I feel really extremely lucky that I was born at the right time. My mother was clever, but she got nowhere. And I, you know, I, I was lucky that reform China opened its door and, you know, you know, reform opening up, uh, which changed many people's life and 800 million people being lifted out of poverty. But um, one factor probably not so well known is that I think the market economy has also expanded the gender inequality. You may ask why, because in, in, as China shifted from the planned, old planned economy to the market economy, um, women showed too much the burden and, and, and showed too much burden cost. For example, women were the first to be let off and a lot more women to be let off than men. And once they lost a job, it's very difficult for them to find re-employment. Some companies will refuse to hire women of childbearing age. Some companies will sack women once they become pregnant. And female graduates have much harder time in finding jobs before what jobs were allocated. Um, the pay gap is widening. Now, uh, in the city, women make 67.3%, while men make in the countryside is even lower at 65%. Um, I think probably I would uh, stop yes. here. And, uh, Mary Thank looking you, at me. Lee jo, that was a really <laughs> comprehensive introduction to what has happened in the last 70 years and a really excellent way to lead into uh, Lele's experiences and the problems facing her generation. Um, thank you. Welcome to here to listen to our lecture. And uh, what, what I'm going to say is really different from Lee just um, speaking. And uh, I'm a feminist activist for seven years, and I worked in a feminist NGO for three years before I came here. And today I'm going to talk about Chinese feminist movement and Me Too movement last year. But uh, specifically, I'm going to talk about uh, Chinese feminist movement of a uh, younger generation because it's really different from uh, the, uh, the, the, the older generation. And uh, it started with, um, I don't know if anybody knows the uh, World Conference for on Women, which is in 1995. And uh, it's uh, the first international conference that uh, China had ever um, uh, given and to show its uh, international, show its uh, openness after the uh, e um, market economy uh, policy. And um, after the conference, a lot of NGOs uh, were set up, a lot of um, uh, prim uh, principles about um, women's study uh, also set up. So we have the uh, ideology uh, grounding and also the uh, we have new uh, tactics on social movement. That's uh, the tools that we can use, uh, which is like um, a grant, so a new generation can can grow up. And um, but uh, although a lot of feminists in uh, uh, elder, elder generation, they uh, work was really hard to. Um, to want to make some change uh, within the system, just from top down, but they, but the situation is uh, no one in no one public, like not so many people know feminism, the word feminism, or uh, they, or uh, even some um, really clear uh, example of um, or event or incident about feminism. There are no feminist voice in there, so a lot of uh, feminists they thought it was time to change. So they trained a lot of young women, um, uh, like me, like Xiao Meili, and uh, <laughs> yeah, and um, and it all start there. I'm gonna show you some actions that we did. And um, <coughs> there are a lot of um, um, clear, uh, like um, uniqueness about all these um, actions. It's not from uh, the right, not in the right time order, but um, we, but we can see uh, there are uh, that we um, we put really emphasis on uh, visual visual image. The goal is to make some sensation to attract um, 
mass media and uh, to uh, spread so that we can spread on social media so uh, we can march our way through the public's eyes so we can talk about feminist issue um, in a more wider space and uh, the people who are in this movement is um, basically um, college student when they did that so they have no money they are not uh, high status as uh, some of the uh, elder generation most of them are in the system uh, school teachers or uh, work in women's federation or something like that uh, they have a, lo a lot of resources they have a really good connection with the government so they can work within the system but we don't have anything we don't have money we don't have um, resources so what we have is um, it's just this uh, creative, so we uh, creative creativity. So we use our creativity to create all this sensation to make our way through. And um, you can see we use uh, our body a lot, which is only that. That's like the only thing that we have. So we use our body as a battleground and um, use uh, nakedness. Use um, use. Uh, uh, oh, there's a. In a picture, like yeah, use um, movement as um, as a way to protest, as a way to uh, ask the government or ask the people who are responsible to take uh, their responsibility to make a change. And um, uh, the issue here um, we covered is really wide: uh, uh, domestic violence, sexual sexual harassment, um, discrimination at workplace or um, equal rights to uh, equal right to get education so um, that means we follow up the current event current uh, thing what happened what happened what is happening in this in China very closely so that we can catch up so that's another um, character char Characteristic uh, of <laughs> of feminist move, uh, young feminist movement is the uh, um, uh, immediate re response. We do not wait. We uh, something happened. We want to, we want people to fix that. We want us to fix that. We do not want to wait ten years to make a, a huge uh, law to fix that because a huge law is not gonna fix that either. We want to uh, fix that f um, case by case. And so with our red like semi-radical uh, move uh, actions uh, some of the policies uh, changed and um, uh, all, all this is uh, our way to make um, our um, agenda uh, to the public side so people when people talk about some social uh, social uh, social topics they can include feminist um, perspective into their discussion and um, there are a lot of tactics that we use. Um, the most um, clear, uh, a clear one is uh, performance art, uh, which um, is a way to kind of uh, protest, kind of um, like a strike. But you, uh, everybody knows that we cannot strike in China, so we use performance arts as a way to, sh to strike, to protest. And um, also uh, legal act actions, also negotiation with the government. And also, uh, uh, even after 2015, uh, feminists five, five, uh, five feminists were arrested because of their sexual harassment, anti-sexual harassment action. We still try to, uh, very hard to use every way we can to um, Change the, change the world to uh, make a difference and uh, but this source of action is not just um, passionate work I, I mean it's really fun to take part in this but it's a uh, really rational um, well thought uh, tactics that we use so that we can uh, make feminism as an idea to uh, be more discussed to know by more people and uh, that's the I think that's the role that we play in the MeToo movement. Even if we, we do not, uh, the we, we are not the the core, uh, the center of uh, MeToo movement last year, but we uh, kind of um, um, 
like making uh, a we are st stepping stone of uh, sexual harassment uh, during all these years. The discussion about sexual harassment uh, have more depths, have more have more widths. So that um, when people talk about sexual harassment last year, they have more awareness about this and. Um, uh, that's when I'm gonna talk about Me Too movement right now. I'm sorry, I have a cold. And um, sorry, could you just talk for another minute or two? A couple more, two more minutes. Okay. okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> So I borrow my friend uh, uh, Ri Ping's uh, the uh, observation about Me Too movement last year. It it, it has uh, it had uh, three uh, stages. One stage is uh, individual centered actions and topics and uh, events. Uh, everybody uh, have their own impact in their uh, actions or uh, on the individual event, um, uh, the individual cases, but they are not connected. So there is uh, no connection, no no. Um, uh, how, how, how should I say that? It's not uh, like uh, a movement because movement uh, you have to be a continuity or or uh, really wide uh, uh, coverage and um, so. But uh, it it does um, foreshadow foreshadow the uh, future, uh, which which is uh, last year the first day um, uh, up. A person called a girl called Luo Xixi who exposed his, uh, her um, tutor professor uh, about twelve years ago uh, th uh, that her tutors harassed her, harassed her, and there were a lot of um, uh, women step up, step up to to join the movement, and um, the f that's le that's lead to <laughs> the second stage that um, that is organized by students and. Uh, uh, this is an uh, action I did um, last year, which is uh, a petition right to the uh, college principals uh, that we uh, we want to uh, start up uh, anti-sexual rights mechanism in, in universities. Um, and uh, there are over 70 uh, universities uh, joined. And um, uh, um, later, all this university, they become a camp or a base of activism. They have their own community. They have own connection, and um, and they connect each other in their own way. And uh, later, they become the core force to expose more uh, university uh, ex uh <laughs> professors and uh, uh, and um, to become the full, uh, core uh, core force to uh, stand up up uh, up against the system, and. And uh, there is July. There was July. Um, uh, the movement moved from NGO uh, to media to entertainment to religion. A lot of um, really powerful men were exposed, and all around uh, the nation, most almost everybody talks about that, or they at least they knew about that. Uh, even my mother knew that. And my, my mother is uh, just normal uh, person from rural. Uh, region and and she knew that so there's a uh, it's really a wide, uh, really wide um, uh, campaign and a lot um, a lot of men were um, take <laughs> were taken into actions. <laughs> I'm really terrified too about the time and um, um, Can so conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we can we can talk more in the Q and A section. I think um, it, it's we will really definitely come back to this subject. <laughs> I think um, yeah, uh, um, some people are got the the punish they deserve, but a lot of people did didn't. So uh, I think in the future we should like a lot of people are waiting in the dark to uh, grab another opportunity to to uh, like t to strike again. So uh, that's okay. The thank you. Is that it? <laughs> thank you very much. We'll hand over to Jessica. <laughs> Okay, so um, the situation in Hong Kong is very different from mainland China, and I think because
because Hong Kong is so much more international and so much more, um, there's so much more freedom of speech and freedom of expression, and also women are very visible um, in business in Hong Kong, there's this idea that Hong Kong is kind of in this post-feminist era, which um, growing up in Hong Kong, I really rejected because I saw kind of pervasion of sexual harassment and um, gender issues in Hong Kong. So when I first started working um, in 2014 at SEMP, um, I was very interested in investigating gender issues in the city. And when I looked into it, there were a slew of really shocking and like just weird and bizarre news reports that were um, to do with gender issues. So for example, in 2014, there was um, a Hong Kong investment firm who um, they found menstrual blood stains in the bathroom because obviously women have their periods. But um, in order to kind of find the culprit of these stains, they wanted to DNA test um, the female colleagues in the office. So that was one news item. Another one was that there was a man who was uh, who in the office stole breast milk from a breastfeeding colleague and drank it because he was stressed out. And actually, this isn't even an isolated incident. There are many reports of this happening in Hong Kong in recent years. Um, there was also a list of, um, I guess, buildings that were to like. They told women, oh, these are buildings in which you should be wary of um, peeping toms because there's a lot of glass in Hong Kong. It's a skyscraper, so it's easy for men to kind of like do upskirting and take pictures of women's skirts um, from below. And the Legislative Council building was actually included on that list. So, um, so yeah, I guess I just I was quite shocked, and I I think that really goes to show that there are a lot of gender issues in Hong Kong that we don't really realize and we don't really talk about, and. I covered um, one case which I thought particularly um, showed this hypocrisy um, and normalization of sexism in Hong Kong, which was in 2015, I think, um, the Equal Op Opportunities Commission in Hong Kong um, filed a case on behalf of a man who accused a club of sexual discrimination because he wasn't able to get free drinks at ladies' night. Um, so it's just kind of showing how you know people still think there's like gender issues isn't a thing in Hong Kong and that we're actually using our anti discrimination laws to support men, like a privileged group, rather than support women and other gender minorities. So for this presentation, I'll quickly touch on three things I think is um, very crucial in Hong Kong. The first is um, gender equity, the second is hidden structural issues, and the third is gender minorities. So just quickly on gender equity, on the surface, as I mentioned before, it seemed like everything is rosy and it seems like Hong Kong is so much better than mainland China or other Southeast Asian countries. But, you know, we can see, um, I got this infographic from the Women's Foundation in Hong Kong in my inbox on International Women's Day. And these figures basically show that that's simply not true. And, you know, actually, um, the gender pay gap has widened. So it's actually going backwards and is behind um, Singapore, the US, Britain, Australia. And um, maternity leave in Hong Kong is only 10 weeks, which is insane. It's one of the shortest maternity leave periods worldwide. Um, also, there's a proliferation of sexual harassment in the workplace and in universities in Hong Kong. So the Equal Opportunities Commission recently released a report um, just on the food and beverage industry in Hong Kong, which said that 80% of women in that industry face sexual harassment at work. So clearly, gender equity is still a very important discussion in Hong Kong that um, um, we need to focus on moving forward. But for me personally, um, I feel like there's a lot of focus on gender equity in um, the mainstream feminist discourse in Hong Kong. And I was more interested um, as a journalist in the hidden um, structural issues in Hong Kong and more invisible um, topics. And so I was, uh, when I was um, working as a journalist, I focused on two issues I found was particularly important. The first is domestic violence, and the second is sex workers. So for domestic violence, I basically, uh, saw that the number of reported cases of domestic violence to NGOs was increasing year by year, and that there were about 3,000 to 4,000 reported cases per year. And when I spoke to experts about this, um, they kind of told me this is actually just the tip of the iceberg, and that research shows that these 3,000, 4,000 cases per year actually only represent around 2% of all domestic violence cases in Hong Kong. And you know, why is this? Um, I think it's um, there's a plethora of factors that are involved, one of which is that um, the majority of domestic violence victims in Hong Kong are actually people of color, so ethnic minorities, so um, 
you know, people who are domestic helpers from Southeast Asian countries, or they are mainland immigrants. And these, uh, these cases go unreported because of access issues and also because of language barriers. And also, these cases only actually are physical abuse cases. And so it doesn't even take into account psychological abuse, right? Um, and, oh, and also, I think this is one point that is similar to mainland China, is that Hong Kong has a very traditional patriarchal attitude in which they think if there's domestic violence, it's a private issue, and it's something that should be dealt with in the home. It's not a public issue. And so there's, this, there's a lack of incentive to come forward because people want to keep things within the home. Um, and the second issue um, on foreign sex workers, so I found that women actually were, uh, Hong Kong had the highest proportion of women in incarcerated worldwide, and about half of these women are actually foreign. And the reason for this is because um, actually a lot of these people who are actually foreign sex workers being arrested and incarcerated in Hong Kong, and instead of kind of giving them support or kind of uh, access to um, legal mechanisms, they're just being incarcerated, and they're being incarcerated for things like um, overstay of their visa or breach of employment um, contract issues. Um, so it really just goes to show there's this whole um, vulnerable population in Hong Kong that we don't really talk about and don't have the access um, that kind of mainstream women do in Hong Kong. Another issue I think is really important to talk about is that there is a real dichotomy between talking about women's issues in Hong Kong and feminism and also LGBTQ community. Um, even though in Hong Kong, because it's very international, you see a lot of things like gay pride and a, you know, a plethora of activities that are pro-LGBTQ um, celebratory activities in Hong Kong, unlike in mainland China, this is actually masking the fact that there are a lot of legal barriers and challenges um, in this community. So, for example, um, same-sex couples, I mean, marriage is not legal between same-sex couples, and also they are unable to apply for public housing, which is a big issue in Hong Kong. They can't have access to life insurance or health insurance as um, through spousal benefits. They um, they can't visit um, a couple in hospitals. For example, if you're a same-sex couple, you, one of them goes to the emergency room. Um, the other one, because they're not recognized as a partner, aren't, will not be allowed to go in. Um, I interviewed uh, a case in which um, there was uh, a person who who was unable to get their partner's ashes after they passed away because they were not recognized as their partner. So there's a lot of heartbreaking issues there um, legally. And I think also one issue that we don't talk about as much is the Hong Kong's trans community. So um, I'll just, yeah, just one last issue. So the trans community, I think, um, is really, it's really behind because like, unlike a lot of, um, I guess, um, cities similar to Hong Kong, in order to officially change your gender in Hong Kong, you have to go through full sex change surgery, which is a very dangerous surgery. It's irreversible and it renders you sterile as well. And in order to qualify for this surgery, you also need to have two years of psychological evaluations, and you need to basically have a doctor diagnose you as having gender identity disorder. And so the fact that you know we have to have all these barriers for trans people who want to change their gender is frankly just not the mark of an international city at all. Um, so I guess okay. I, thank you very much. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I just want to conclude though that. Basically, traditional attitudes and deep-rooted stereotypes in Hong Kong are the biggest challenges, and I really hope that we can keep this discussion alive in Hong Kong because it's, uh, yeah. Okay, I'll move on. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much to all the speakers. That's an enormous amount of information. We've covered a huge uh, amount of ground from Lee Jia's grandmother uh, right through to the Me Too movement and and what's happening in Hong Kong. And I think that one of the questions that's come out of the discussion so far is the question of um, the balance of legal change versus cultural change. So I just want to rest that there for a moment, and we will come back to it. But first of all, um, uh, I'd like to pick up on something that Lee Jar was talking about, about just how... Um, different the expectations of women have been at different points in the last 60, 70 years. Um, and perhaps you could develop a bit more what you were saying about how difficult it is for women now. Um, is it the case that women have been pushed back by reform and opening up and, and by the market? 
And I'm wondering, um, Lele, as well, if you could also tell us a bit about what it's like for young women to try and get a job, what sort of discrimination they face in, in, in the workplace, in the labour market. And I think the, um, it is a complex picture. And I, as I mentioned briefly, I think the reforms opening up brought huge benefits to both men and women, particularly urban educated women. Um, I think they were, I, I think my Western friends often felt, and they cannot believe that how, and I always say that market economy has actually expanded the gender inequality. Um, I, I think basically I believe that because um, the government retreated a lot of its responsibility to let the market to take over. Um, I also wrote a piece for the New York Times, and you know some companies um, would, you know, they, they put up advertisements, things like, uh, um, no woman need to apply for no particular reason, or they want uh, a woman to be working as a sales job. They want a woman to be 1.75 meters high and beautiful and sexy. So they can, this is the market is very much, I mean, China, on one hand, is very controlled, but on the other hand, it's also not that well regulated. And I think, the, so as a result, I think, the, unfortunately, um, the, I see the, um, you know, the, the the in increasing gap between the uh, gender gap. Um, um, yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Lele, what's your experience um, uh, of women of your age who are looking for work? Um, do they have difficulty finding work? Is, a, is it, do they have difficulty in the workplace as well being taken seriously? Is there a problem of sexual harassment? at work yeah uh, one of our uh my former organization's um top issue is um discrimination at workplace so a lot of um i think most chinese women when they go find a job uh, they have the experience of uh, uh, the employee want men over women because they are men and i don't know why uh, a, a lot a lot of friends of mine they find uh, they want um jobs like cook uh, Chinese cook. Um, do you know most Chinese cook uh, are men uh, in restaurant and but most uh, cooking responsibility in the household are bared by women. So that's like the irony when you move into the public section when you uh, can make money through uh, cooking. Uh, it, it's where women is um, in, uh, like ignored. And um, uh, there are a lot of also a lot of sexual harassment in the in the workplace. A lot of uh, complaint would um, uh, a, a lot of women would talk to us about their experience. And um, I think the most of the most severe um, question uh, problem is uh, um, a lot of women got fired because of their pregnancy. And because the companies, they don't want to take responsibility about the maternal leave, they have to, I think they have to pay some uh, money uh, during the maternal leave. So they, um, most of uh, the company just uh, fire the woman. And um, uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, and also because of two child policy, uh, women are, about more like find, like find more difficulty to find to find a job because when you are uh, not married, uh, the company would think, "Ha, huh, you are gonna get married soon," or if you have one child, they are gonna think you have you will have another child. If you have two child, they might think, "Oh, it's too old for us to hire you now." So it's just like yeah, yeah, it's an uh, internal difficulty. Um. So it has been said that the Me Too movement was um, a copycat movement that was copying what was happening in the US and Europe. Would you agree with that? Was it homegrown? Why did it take off so quickly? <laughs> of course, it's not, co it's not copycat. Like, it's, it's impossible for, for someone to copycat just uh, based on Western experience then uh, grow up a thriving movement. It's just not possible. Um, you know, as I said uh, in the in the in the uh, in my speaking, uh, they 
um, uh, a lot of people laid a lot of groundwork uh, to lead to this movement. A lot of uh, a brave women they spoke up uh, way before uh, Me Too movement last year, and it took. It took the, a lot of uh, energy, a lot of um, trauma to do that. And that's why women talk about sexual harassment more right now. It's not, it's not, it's, it's not. Uh, of course, uh, we are influenced by the Western um, country, countries, uh, especially by Hollywood culture. But it's just one factor of um, this big movement. I just want to jump in on that. I think definitely the B2 movement in China is very localized and there's a danger of kind of painting transnational solidarity sometimes with Me Too movement in China because, you know, if anything that's seen as Western, it's immediately, oh, these are, you know, foreign hostile forces when, you know, in reality that's not true. And like you pointed out, the movement is not, there's no one or two leaders. It's very decentralized. It's about, you know, it's a very diplomatic kind of movement. And I think that that's very important to think about as well. Um, and just to pop in the Hong Kong side of Me Too, it, it, weirdly, even though Hong Kong is very international, you would expect there to be kind of a strong Me Too movement, but there actually haven't been many Me Too cases. There's only one or two. And so it, it, I think it's interesting to see how things have been very different in mainland China and in Hong Kong as well. Thanks. Uh, well, Lele said that there's been a lot of groundwork, and I'd, I'd like to call on Xiaomei Li, if we could. Um, as one of the people who was really um, instrumental in doing that groundwork, uh, can you talk about how, why you chose the issue of domestic violence in particular and why you chose the tactics that you did, for instance, walking through the centre of, of Beijing in bloodied wedding dresses? Uh, why did you use those kind of performance art tactics? <laughs> Do you want to? Would you like to come up? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. I can stand. What chat do <音>就是他就问你为什么选择这个我们还为什么选择这个这种形式所谓的行为行为艺术这个形式谈的特别谈的那个那个wedding <音> 大众媒体那我们就是通过社交媒体 okay. <laughs> um, as, um, as why we choose this form as uh, Lele mentioned briefly that uh, young feminists are, like us we are not very uh, have, don't have rich resources I mean we don't have we are not very rich so we have to choose um, but we know how to understand we understand how to use social media. 你说是不是还有什么嗯还有就是当时的当时的主流媒体我觉得我们是找到了一个呃窗口期就在那个时候呃就是对于新闻的审查还没有到现在这么严重然后我们刚好这个话题又是相对于温和又相对于比较激进的
And at that time, as, as why we choose this issue of um, anti-domestic violence, because that was one of the things we talked a lot. There was um, the problem was uh, uh, quite serious, and so that was then. But now, for example, the anti-sexual harassment is a big topic we are dealing now. Um, I'm sorry, I just wanted to. Right. <laughs> I just wanted to mention that Shamini was one of the most uh, very prominent um, feminist activist, and in 2014 she walked all the way from Beijing to Guangzhou um, to um, you know to uh, to make people aware the issue of um, sexual harassment, and I walked with her for, for some time. <laughs> Do you understand the concept of Beijing to Guangzhou? It's like when you walk from, when you walk from Iceland to London? Yeah. For half a year. 2,000 kilometers. Yeah. And, and I mean, I think, you know, for, for those who don't know, we, sh I mean, we should really kind of pay tribute to the impact um, of the campaigns that Meili has been involved in because the, you know, that uh, what you might think of as a stunt by uh, wearing bloodied bridesmaid dresses uh, got a lot of attention on social media and we do now have the domestic violence law, which is, I don't know which... Uh, it's quite a progressive law in, in some ways. It includes psychological harassment. It includes um, uh, uh, protection orders. And it's, um, you know, the qu this question is how will it be implemented, of course. But also the, the Me Too movement, which took off across campuses, has led to the Ministry of Education promising to produce a code of conduct. Um, it's led to some discussion of a law on sexual harassment. So... You know, these these um, kind of apparently small efforts have had quite big consequences, um, and that does raise a question about um, uh, the increase in censorship in China at the moment and the restrictions on the internet. Because um, I believe there have been a hundred and forty thousand blogs closed down since December last year. Uh, including, um, you know, uh, kind of video channels that are quite frivolous, really. So w what you managed to, to really amplify your effect through the internet with increasing censorship, what does that mean for feminist organising? What does it mean for the future? Can I just follow up with what you've been talking about? So why they choose these, um, your, um, the wedding gown, so-called stance, called performance art, and, and also the you know, queuing up the toilet and the shaving of the head. The, uh, China from 2014, uh, 2012, China saw a series of uh, um, feminist activism. And I think because they, they choose this so-called Xing Wei Yi Shu, performance art, because that was... Uh, something uh, regarded as acceptable uh, by the authority that protests would not be uh, acceptable. And I'm uh, talking about, you mentioned about anti uh, Tabasco violence, and I believe the, in 2016 China passed a nationalized anti domestic violence law, law. It was a really monumental, but I do believe that um, works done by people like Xiaomei Li and other people and they work with NGO, lobby with uh, legislators and they, without their efforts, there would not be this nationwide law that passed in 2016. Oh, um. <咳>我觉得这个审查对我们的那个行动的影响是非常大的。呃，因为从呃一二年的时候，我我开头也讲，我们是用了那个自自媒体和主流媒体，才可以达到一些呃政策上的改变。
还有对公众的意识提升。但是很快的，嗯、呃，我觉得是从二零一四年开始，呃，就是我们之前的这个方式就已经渐渐的开始失灵了。Yeah, just kind of summarize that uh, um, in in 2012, uh, they they mentioned this uh, series of uh, performance art that that was still being um, acceptable, and also they used uh, uh, social media, and also they used uh, like. 像也包括微信这样这样的吧 ，Yes, WeChat and personal、um, messaging and such.、Um, but since, but in recent years, there has been there has been crackdown in China. The people you have probably noticed that become、uh, more difficult. 对，呃，所以其实二零一五年之后，我们一直在寻找一个新的方式，可以继续去进行我们的工作。呃，但我们从呃很早开始，可能一一年开始，我们也一直在做社群的工作，包括各种培训，还有我们的戏剧的创作和演出，呃，都是这些工作，现在还仍然在做。So since t w e n t we have been finding ways to how to work,、uh, you know, facing the face of、uh, censorship. So the Have finding, um, um, for example, community work. For example, theatre work. They they have been、uh, very much involved、uh, with the theatre. The vagina monologue. They just staged one、uh, on the 19th, just a few days ago. <laughs> If everybody want to see our our play,、yeah. <laughs> please contact me. <laughs> 对，呃，然后，呃，我觉得 Me Too 的出现对我们来说是一个，呃，在二零一五年之后的一个新的转机，就是，呃，因为 Me Too 它是一个去中心化的一个运动，所以它对那个政治审查，它是一个有免疫免疫能力的，就是每个女生她可能都是那个被骚扰的当事人，她都可能站出来，所以，呃，以前政府他们，呃，想要控制我们的行动的话，他们就是通过打击我们嘛，就像我前几年我们一直在搬家一样，然后，呃，但是现在。没有办法去抓到所有的想要发起这些行动的人。I'll try, try to say that. So, um, so Me Too movement is a really、uh, a momentous turning point, um, because it's about regarding about、uh, sexual harassment. So any anybody, any women can. Any or just anybody can be potentially a victim. That concerns everybody. So、um, the government, in theory, cannot stop people、uh, talking about this issue, right?、Mm -hmm. So yeah, and you also said I think important to know that before it was a lot about crackdowns personally. So like you had to move houses and move homes every so often. But now because it's so much more decentralized, the government is it's impossible for them to crack down and just identify one person. 啊，对，有段时间我就非常的开心，然后呢，很快，但是很快的，我们就意识到了，就还是有问题，就是这种完全去中心化的这个运动，它是呃没有办法像以前一样，就是至少呃我们还可以有组织或者有人去引导这个运动该怎么样做，但是现在的问题就是它的关注量非常的大，然后大家有很多的能量，但是没有任何的组织和个人他可以去呃做梳理，呃做做引导。<laughs> um, if Li Jia could translate this, then perhaps we'll move on to another question. Right, okay. So for a while, for a while, I was quite happy because you know. Um, um, but as she then realized this this decentralized movement of Me Too movement,、um, there lots of energy, there lots of anger, but then there also there's a lack of、uh, leadership, lack of direction. Um, okay, so given that lack of leadership, lack of direction,、um, where do you think it's important to go? Is it more important to have legal change or cultural change? How do these two things work together?、Uh, perhaps Lee Jock could answer that first.、Um, maybe I can try in another way. To, sorry, I'll. 那么就现在就面面对这样的问题的话，那么将来我们的方向是往哪边去呢？就，嗯，对，那，那 maybe I should start talking about the the obstacles China facing in order to reach a real、uh, feminist movement. To start with, uh, uh, the the government censorship and then crack down in the Me Too movement. I mean, for example, one the、um, one university student from Be Beida, and she tried to.、Um, Probe into the case of suicide of a student. Probably she was raped、uh, by a professor, 
and she was uh, harassed, and her parents, her family were harassed. And so it has been uh, very difficult. So the government cracked down. I mean, just uh, if without the government crackdown, and I really believe that China's uh, feminist movement would have reached um, a much bigger sc uh, scale. And I met um, uh, Xiao Meili uh, in 2014 when um, there was uh, still a um, um, feminist voice. This very important, influential feminist platform was still uh, was shut down last year on International Women's Day. Um, they organized this China's first feminist school, and both Sean Mei Li and I we were graduates. And at that time, we were so excited, and they would just seem so hopeful, and there would just seem to be so many young people were interested, in so many people taking part in um, activism. And so this is a problem China facing is why is that the government control censorship? Um, and another one is, I think, still. Um, I'm disappointed to say, sorry to say, that's disinterest in the public. For example, last year there was this famous case of fake, fake vaccine, and some, thousands of people walked to the protest. You know, though there's something seems to care about more. And also, I think the culture, and with how can we change the culture, it's still steeped in this patriarchal culture, you know, the how of Confucianism, Confucianism still place women as inferior. And also just because of the culture, like, you know, I'm so disappointed that some public intellectuals, men, liberal, and even human rights activist, a human rights lawyer, one of my personal friends, you know, famous, and rights um, activists, they are, some of them are misogynists, misogynist. and for example, um, this guy, Liu Yun, who's a famous intellectual, and he said, uh, uh, during the Me Too movement, he said women should not uh, talk, share their experience in the social media, because that would encourage fake claim. Uh, fake, um, and, and as he said, that you should s uh, solve the problems through law. I mean, in China, it's a lot really difficult to solve the problems through law. And the problem is not uh, making face claim. It's, um, the problem is the opposite. It's true. It's true. So many women suffered from sexual uh, harassment. They are victims, but they because this culture of blaming victim. Um, so they keep silent. So I think it is, uh, yes, so in that aspect, it's... Um, so it is a bit daunting. <laughs> I want to uh, throw the questions open to the audience now. Um, is there? Well, you, you look like you're itching to say something. Yeah, because what we did um, um, from the start is uh, we also we did um, uh, legal advocacy and also uh, about race uh, people's awareness of course and uh, I think the Me Too movement pro um, proved something that um, like in most Western countries they have the um, mechani mechanism they have the legal system um, like uh, like theoretically to uh, support the victims, but why me too happened is um, the legal system is not enough. Uh, we still have to speak out. We still have to uh, use the social media, use some um, public opinion to get justice. That's um, that's the importance of um, of uh, uh, of culture, and also but also uh, if um, we don't have the mechanism to support us, we are always helpless. We are always know. We, we always know um, if our, our voice is not heard, we cannot have another way to solve that. So it's. Uh, I don't think it's uh, like you have to choose one between two. So, yeah. So little time. Um, I guess one main thing I also want to point out is um, I think correct me if I'm wrong, but kind of moving forward, the most important thing, one of the most important things is kind of population policies and kind of that, you know, a rising sense of neonatalism in China, where um, a lot of women are going to be pressured towards having like two or three children if there's no child policy. And I think we can already see this happening, um, where recently the, um, there was a, a story about how there was a database of, a man created like this database of breed re ready women in China. And so that you know, that's also one thing where, like, you can already see that kind of start, um, not only officially, but also just, um, yeah, in China. But Yeah. 
Okay, I think that's a very important question that, that Jesse has raised there. Uh, the database of Breed Ready Women, we don't really know whose database it is. Um, it's got 1.8 million names in it. Uh, it. It could be a dating agency, but one of the reasons to be so anxious about it is because of the, the push from the very top um, to change uh, well, to, since the, the ending of the one-child policy, to pressurize women to have two children and particularly to pressurize uh, highly educated women. So it used to be the case that if you were a university student in China, you couldn't legally get married. And that law changed in about 2005. Uh, and now we're seeing, you know, on the front of People's Daily, we're seeing uh, enormous pictures of highly pregnant university students um, and pictures of, of uh, you know, university students in their, in their gowns and so on, with their just completely as cutouts, completely blacked out, but holding a baby. And um, articles about how it's really important to have your children young. So, so I also want to put one add on pressure. with that, is mm -hmm. that um, that's also just Han women. So like, for example, in terms of ethnic minority women, like Tibetan women, um, you know, there, there isn't that push for them. There really is that push for we want women to have more children, but we want Han women to have more children. So I think yeah. that's also an important distinction to focus on. Yeah, I agree. Uh, but, but it does, you know, I think the question really is about... Um, you know, the, the, how important is it for, because what, what we're seeing is this real fusion of China's particular fusion of patriarchy and authoritarianism and strongman politics. And so we're seeing under Xi Jinping, we're seeing a, a, a kind of big push to uh, present China um, as a strong nation and to have a much greater push towards cultural conformity. And at the same time, we're seeing as you said, a neonatal movement, a, a drive for, for women to, um, uh, to have more children. And how much of a threat is this to the freedoms that women have? Will women be... There's no evidence that they're willing to have more children. But how do you see this situation developing? Lee <laughs> John. It's funny you should raise this question because I'm just planning to um, write an article about why China's the, the, the low birth rate. You know, China relaxed the family um, where now people now are allowed to have second children and uh, the government certainly expected a lot more women or take it up, but uh, no, um, the birth rate is uh, quite low. In fact, it's already lower than the US. Um, and lots of uh, educated urban women, they do not necessarily want to have two children or sometimes some of them choose don't have children at all and those uh, mostly you know those um, women in their late 20s early 30s they're mostly one child um, belong to the you know um, one child generation and they um, they are quite uh, assertive when they you know they are willing to uh, you know put up the pressure from the family yes Uh, I don't know if uh, any of uh, the Chinese friends knew that uh, there is a new policy um, carried out this year that said uh, if an employee, if an employee, employee want to uh, uh, do an in in interview, um, he, he or she or they cannot ask the uh, marriage situation of the interview interviewee. Yeah, it's a new policy. I think um, the contradiction of um, uh, two child policies is that um, the the country, the nation, the con the government really want you to have children. But uh, on the uh, on the other hand, is that our economy is declining, so you have to push more women to work. So you have to um, only only one hand you have to ha uh, ask them to have 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 children, but you have to also ask them to have uh, to, to work so they put all this burden to to Chinese women it's like insane I think there will be um, more tension between the nation and women in China uh, uh, 
，然然后呃，然后就是呃，但是我觉得我们这一代人，就是八零后、九零后，是比较中国比较特殊的一代女性，就是呃，我是非常反对一胎政策的，但是呃，就是我们这一代人，他是在一胎政策下面的一些意外的好处，就是我们拥有了整个家庭所有的资源，我们这些女孩子，我们没有弟弟跟我们抢遗产，呃，我可以去到最好的大学。<笑><笑>然后，对，所以这这一代的女孩，我觉得我们是一个堤坝，我们一定要坚守我们这个呃，就是之前的前辈留下来的性别平等的一些遗产。Yeah, so I think um kind of this is a really like new kind of generation of women in which um you know we were able to kind of be like the only child kind of um have like a, you know. Opportunities to go to university and work. So, although we don't support the one-child policy, there were a lot of kind of accidental benefits to the one-child policy that we currently enjoy and that that we are also trying to protect moving forward.、Um, and I think one thing that's in,、um, I wanted to point as well is that the way that the government is、um, kind of putting a lot of, of these pressures onto women, it's also they're not, instead of、um, using more like policies to. Um, allow women to work, for example, in, improving like childcare facilities or kind of improving like support systems for women. It's kind of instead of doing that, they're kind of taking this、um, stance of trying to shame women instead of you know like you you're supposed to have it all, you're supposed to be able to do it all, which I think is is again just shifting the blame from policy onto individual women themselves. And I think that is something that's not just unique to China, but also in Hong Kong and also in the Western countries as well. Yeah, thank you very much.、Um, can I see who would like to ask a question? In in the green at the front. Um, hi, I'm from Hong Kong. Um, so I were in 2013. I was working at MC International. Um, there was a case of Li Yan. Um, a Chinese woman who was sentenced to death penalty because she killed her husband after years of domestic abuse.、Um, now that could have happened. That happened, and you know we were able to petition for her and fought the case from Hong Kong. Now I don't see really that happening anymore. So it's the civil society retreating in Hong Kong and、uh, quite worrying trends. So I guess my question is just with. You know, Hong Kong used to be a base where, if things don't work in China, that you could come and <laughs> do the advocacy from Hong Kong. But now, where do where do where can the Chinese feminists go?、Um, should they just work out of London, or where can they <laughs> organize themselves? Yeah, I, mean, I think that's a really good question, really difficult one as well. Because when I pointed out before, it's. It's important to have transnational kind of activism to do with Chinese feminism, but then there's also the danger of you know having too many links to foreign countries because then you're kind of branded as having like you know backing of for, foreign hostile forces. And I also have it's not just a feminist issue, but I think、um, there's a lot of issues in Hong Kong in terms of like、um, freedom of speech being curtailed, and、um, there's pressure on that side as well of the act- activism side. And I've Kind of learned of organizations seeing Taiwan as kind of a better place to organize or a better place to、um, yeah have these activities. So I think it is very troubling.、Um, but I'll hand it over to Lele. What do you think in terms of? Oh, or maybe. Um. Uh. Li Yan, that case, the end, 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 <笑>对，然后呃，我会觉得呃，就是在中国做女权运动的话，肯定不能说我在伦敦或者是我在呃台湾做，肯定还是要去到呃。去到我们自己的城市，就是包括呃，就算我们的社交媒体上面的审查非常的严重，但是我们还是会坚定的留在微信，留在人最多的地方。嗯，对。Okay, so, um, when the sentence, uh, sentencing of Li Yan, um, I was there and also Lily was there, and just summarize what she said. So, um, so to engage in feminist activity. Um, the answer is probably is not going to be Taiwan or London.、Um, we're we're going to stay in mainland China, and、uh, we'll st-、um, it's probably the censorship in the Weixing is censored, but still we'll stay in mainland China. We're still using stay stick with Weixing. <laughs> okay.、Um, who else would like to ask a question? Okay. Hi. My name is Felicia, and I'm looking more at the consumer insight and economic、uh, point of things. 
And I was wondering if we don't see a different picture from the obvious lack of legislation and how China is behind on these things, and also mentality, yes, Confucianism and still a patriarchal system. But on the ground, the facts are that, and I don't know if you've benchmarked that, is that today Chinese women are actually better off than in a lot of places in the world. So what we see now is um, a huge over-representation of women in universities. Um, women uh, is part of the workforce. It's one of the highest percentages in the world. 55% of um, new internet companies in China in 2017 were started by women. 25% of entrepreneurs um, in China are women. And the highest number of self-made billionaires in the world are Chinese. So my question is, um, are we afraid, and, and that is actually, that was carried by the Chinese economy and the opening, and also perversely, as was said, by the um, one-child policy, because women were equal as, as the one child. But are we then afraid that the gap of legislation is going to make things worse again? Do we, are we saying that legislation now has to catch up, because when the economy slows down, women might not be in such a uh, favorable position anymore. Lija? Um, I still, I'm not, sorry. I, I, I'm, I'm saying that legislation is behind, but actually the, the current situation of Chinese women is in the workplace. Well, it's, it's a good place. Okay, so are Chinese women doing well in the workplace? And are Chinese women actually overrepresented in the economy? Um, no, to that, the, the question that legislation is, needs to no, catch up. The question is, because of the lack of legislation that we have now, are we thinking that it might make matters worse for Chinese women? Because actually now, in terms of economic terms, they're doing very well on a, on a yes, international I, as comparison. I, as I mentioned briefly, and um, I think it's a complex picture. So, um, Women are doing quite well in business, um, not doing not well at all in, in politics because there's the lack of presentation of them. Um, so I don't quite understand your question of uh, lack of legislation. So I'm, I'm saying that we're talking a lot about legislation and lack of legislation. And are we saying that this is super important because as we look forward, we foresee that the, the status of women and where they are is going to deteriorate because of the lack of uh, legislation. Yeah, I think what you've pointed out is a really strange thing in which um, China, like women in China seem to be doing very well economically, right? And there's a lot of representation compared to maybe Southeast Asian countries. And then on the other hand, there's all this lack of legislation in terms of like domestic violence, sexual harassment that we've talked about. And I think that dichotomy, what I have to say is that I don't think it's mutually exclusive and I think sometimes when we look at women's issues we focus too much on economic output and we don't really um, focus on things like sexual liberation or choice and it's not like having you know women's rights it's not just oh let's have women be able to contribute to the workforce as on the same level as men it's also you know can women be able to be sexually liberated and make their own decisions about their bodies and so I think there are two very separate discussions um, and, and that both are very important to think about. Time for one more question, I think. Um, someone in grey behind you there. Hi, so um, I'm actually from Beijing, I live in Beijing, and uh, I actually do see in recent years that uh, censorship in China has grown a lot, and um, it really scares me because I don't, from a political point of view, I can see the Chinese government trying to grow uh, like grow more of a sense of like uh, nationalism but I don't know why that is being applied to feminist movements like why do you think that is uh就是我是从北京我是北京长大的 Okay, thank you. Uh, so why is increasing nationalism being applied to feminist movements and to the position of women in the family? Uh, 
I think we're talking about the why a government tried to crack down on feminism. It's simple because uh, on, on you know uh, five feminists were arrested um, in 2015, just before day before International Women's Day, because they were trying to organise the government. The Chinese government doesn't like any uh, you know organisation, any collective activity. They felt threatened, and for them they. I mean, I'm sure the government wants to improve a woman's position. Um, that, that they do some of the good things. Just, um, just a few weeks ago, the the central government published pub, issued a directive banning um, companies to put advertisements such as um, um, men only, men preferred, or banning government to demand them when they interview. They sometimes will ask women. Do you plan to get married? Do you plan to have children in the next, you know, five, ten years or something? Now, now this kind of questions are banned, so that's a good. But um, in the end, I think the government probably they all, uh, they want to improve women's position, but their priority is to maintain stability. That's why they are frightened of the activist and feminist movement. And um, um, if you see Me Too movement, you can see the the power that feminist movement can make, uh, Chinese women can make. That um, and also and also uh, that's why that's why uh, the Ch Chinese government are afraid of um, a fe a feminist pow power and um, also uh, I think uh, there are a lot of um, uh, forces that uh, they used to uh, there used to be a lot of forces stand in front of uh, in front of us like uh, labor movement like um, uh, um, um, uh, human human rights uh, movement. Like um, uh, liberal, liberal, uh, um, yeah, liberal um, uh, movement, um, but they all, they all in in, in some way they all got um, uh, oppressed. A lot of uh, human rights lawyers were arrested. A lot of labor. Um, right now, one of our friends were arrested because of uh, his the labor. Uh, his involve, involvement in the labor movement. So Chinese, Ch Chinese feminist movement is like the, once, the last line, um, uh, the last um, wall is like uh, sta standing, the last one standing in front of, um, um, I don't know how to say that, it's the, the last one, it's just like that, yeah. Last wall, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jesse, do you want to comment on this? Um, yeah, I think uh, just I think you covered it very well. I mean, I think uh, one other point is also just growing nationalism in China and trying to figure out what it means to be Chinese. And I think you know the the state is kind of trying to co-opt that a lot by saying like how do how how can you be like um, proper Chinese women or kind of like what is the proper attitude for you know, Chinese women to be. And I think that's, you know, a conversation that is really important going forward. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think that's about all that we've got time for. Uh, so I'd like to thank everybody very much for coming and thank our speakers particularly. <laughs>so one is we actually um, recorded this lecture and um, so if you have questions about that you can talk to me about it and also um, we're going to move over to the SOAS bar for a few drinks and feel free to join us um, we can <laughs> go over with Aki and he will sign you in if you don't have access so yeah. thank you so much for coming <laughs>